We continue heading through the book of Ruth, and uh, we looked at uh, part of this, uh, chapter 4, um, last week, and we continue looking at it uh, this week. We begin with verse 1, Ruth chapter 4. This is God's word, eternally true. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you, want, if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here ends our reading. Uh, We have a response of thankfulness printed for us on the bottom left of your bulletin there. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks indeed. Let's pray. I've entitled this gospel lesson, A Kingdom of Putting Others First. Uh, We we speak of uh, David here at the last Uh, part of what we read in verse 17 there, and and this is the importance of Ruth, the importance of Naomi. They give to us David, uh, the ideal king, and if you read through the the kings in Israel in the Old Testament, they're all compared to David. They're either good kings because they did like their father David, or they're bad kings because they did not do like their father David. David is the centerpiece of an ideal king in Israel. But yet we learn 
that David had his failings as we go through uh, First and Second Samuel and, and First Chronicles. We see that David had these failings, but there's a son of David, not Solomon, uh, not uh, uh, Joash, uh, not Hezekiah, but a son of David, Jesus, who arrives on the scene and whom the Jews during that day rightly identify as the son of David, a king for them. Um, there's this son of David that we, that we follow. And being son of David, that was a king title. That wasn't just cute or another thing to say or a synonym because I got tired of saying Jesus. They called him son of David, and what they meant during the Gospels, as we read the Gospels during Jesus' life, what they meant is that you are our king. See, there were many people who were descended from David during that day. But to call someone son of David was to call him king. And this is why, of course, the Jews were tremendously disappointed in Jesus. Because they had in their minds a a king who would be like David in terms of establishing a geopolitical kingdom, Israel again. With physical land, with uh, Uh, the law of Moses governing this physical land and all who lived in this land. And Jesus comes and says, no, 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 no. My kingdom is bigger than this. My kingdom will include people who come from east and west and from all over and who sit at the table of Abraham. And the Jews during Jesus' day were upset by this because they wanted by virtue of their race to be able to declare themselves as better than the Romans, the non-Jews who occupied their land, better than the people of the world. And, And if they could do that by race, by DNA, then they didn't have to have a good heart toward the Lord, repentance and faith in their hearts. They didn't have to deal with their hearts. They could just say, because I was born this way, I am better than everybody else. And so Jesus makes this point, and he looks at the Jews during his day, and the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jews, and he looks at their hearts, and he says, you're a wicked and evil and perverse generation. And he says to them, like John the Baptist said to them, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why is the kingdom of God at hand? Because the son of David is there, the king. And since the king, Jesus was there, the kingdom of God was at hand. And anybody who would follow Jesus as their king would be part of that kingdom. And this morning we look at what is this kingdom like? And we know what this kingdom is like by looking at what this kingdom's king is like. What is is Jesus like? And what we see here in the book of Ruth is what we we see in his forebear, Boaz. What is Boaz like? What is the stock of this righteous kingdom of God that God commanded in Deuteronomy 17 and spoke of in Deuteronomy 28? A kingdom that would come out of Genesis 49, out of the line of Judah, from whom the scepter would not depart. What is the character of this kingdom? And this kingdom is characterized by what this title is of this gospel lesson. It's a kingdom of putting others first. This is not just another gospel lesson for you this morning. Um, This is a lesson, if you get it, it will change your whole life. Your funeral will be different if you get what we're talking about here. Your whole life will change. The way your spouse responds to you will change. The way your kids respond to you will change. The way your mom or dad, if they're still living, will, and the way they treat you will change. The way your coworkers will treat you will change. This message this morning hits at the heart of who God is, at the heart of who Jesus is, at the heart of who we are supposed to be. This this morning is not just interesting facts. 
This is something that, that if we get it, it changes us from the inside out. If we live this, we see it starts to bless us beyond what we could imagine. And, and there will be things that will happen to us and things that people will say to us that we just can't believe how good this is. Now, all that said, you'll still get persecuted because you're following Jesus. But your souls, like the good song says, your souls will be well. I got your attention. I did. Everything got real quiet. So good. Um, as we look at this text, there are a couple of things we want to say this morning. And the first thing is this. Number one, if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that or you can just listen. And it's this. Jesus, Jesus like Boaz, was selfless. We're supposed to understand that about Jesus. And we see this in shadow form in the Old Testament with Boaz. Boaz foreshadows what Jesus is like. Jesus physically descended from Boaz. Jesus, like Boaz, was selfless. If you look down and, and go ahead, you're, you're on it there, or, or if you closed up your Bible, open it back up again. Uh, you can see it uh, throughout the book of of Ruth here, what, what Boaz is like. Joshua judges Ruth, and we're there, verse, chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 9. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the girls. And I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water of the jars the men have filled. Here's what Boaz says. Take my stuff. I'm not going to charge you for it. Take my grain. As much grain as you need. Don't build your own well. Don't, don't, don't dig for, 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 for your own water. Just, just go to my pots. I'll take care of you. I'll do the work. You just benefit. There's no uh, economic advantage for Ruth being on Boaz's property. He only loses. And this is Boaz being selfless. What can I do for you, Ruth? You, you foreigner who, don't belong, who doesn't belong here. You who have come along just a, 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 a scab. Just a, a picking up stuff off the side of the field. Boaz says, what can I do for you? A complete loss to himself. Selfless. Or look at verses 14 through 17. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. And she sat down. Apparently they liked that. <laughs> when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got out up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull some out from the stalks for her, from the bundles, and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. Eat all you want. And Boaz doesn't turn to her and say, by the way, that'll be twelve ninety-five plus an 18% gratuity. Okay? He just gives it to her. He's just generous. He's just selfless. Here, take this... Take this food. Here, you want some more? Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I had a, a great example. My, my dad would be like this. I'd, you know, he'd have something, and, and I'd say, oh, wow, and I'd look at it. He'd say, here, here, you want this? He literally would say that, you know, this thing that belonged to him. Here, you want this? Do I... No, I don't have, I'm not wearing any of his clothes today. <laughs> and I didn't bring my, my, my nice wool uh, overcoat. It's just beautiful. He said, here, you want this? And he gave it to me. I should have brought that this morning. He gave it to me. Uh, some of the suits that I wear, he gave to me. All these things I have. He just said, here, you want this? Here, take it. Okay? This is, this is selflessness. I have something that could help you? Great. Take it. So Jesus, like, Jesus, Jesus like Boaz, uh, was selfless. Look at, verse 20, look at verse 21 in this same chapter, chapter 2. Then Ruth the Moabite said, here's how she describes Boaz. He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. 
Okay, there's barley harvest, there's wheat harvest, there's several harvests throughout the... And Boaz says, here, just keep taking from me. Don't pay for it. Keep taking my water, keep taking my grain, keep taking as much as you need to feed yourself and your mother-in-law, Naomi. Or verse 23. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. Okay. Now take a look at verse or chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 13. Verse 13. Boaz says, stay here for the night. And in the morning... Now, now, Ruth has gone to Boaz during the night. And as we saw in Deuteronomy 25, you know, Naomi is the widow. Okay? And her husband, Elimelech, has died. And, and this property uh, belongs to her, belongs to Naomi, but there's going to be no male heir to carry on the line of her husband, Elimelech, to carry on his name. And so she needs a near kinsman like Deuteronomy 25, to come. And she's too old to bear children. But she has this daughter-in-law, Ruth, who can bear children. And so Ruth goes to, to Boaz and says, you're, you're a kinsman of ours. And, and what she offers is that you, know, you buy this land from Naomi. You marry me. We have a kid and the kid takes on the property for Elimelech and not for you, Boaz. You'll pay for the land, but you'll lose it to Elimelech's descendants. And your firstborn will belong to Elimelech, who's now dead. And so you see in chapter 4 that we read in our gospel reading this morning that, that uh, Boaz mentions this over and over to the near kinsmen. You buy this land, but it's really to, to carry out the inheritance of Elimelech. So to the near kinsman, he says, if you buy it, you're going to lose it. Okay. You've got to marry Ruth. You're going to have a kid. The kid's not going to be your own, so to speak. It's going to carry on the name of Elimelech. And so here in this chapter, chapter 3, verse 13, he says, uh, stay here for the night to Ruth, Boaz says this, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, that's an oath, I will do this. As surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. This is Boaz being selfless. Not only will I lose money to you and all the grain you've taken, not only will I, I lose water to you as you eat it, not only will I lose wine vinegar, which I like, uh, but also I will pay to buy all this property. Imagine buying a lot around here, $40,000, you know, for a lot, of a, for, you know, a, a piece of property to build a house. You know, so that's a small lot uh, in some neighborhoods, $40,000 here in Clayton, roughly average. You're paying $40,000. Imagine that right now, your bank account your retirement, whatever you got, paying $40,000 and saying, I'm just going to lose that. Pull that out of your IRA or pull that out of your 401k. $40,000, you're just going to lose. It's going to go to, to Naomi's line. Okay? Imagine doing that just for, for a neighbor. You know, three people down the street. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this property. He's bankrupt. And you say, I'm going to buy this property from you and then I'm going to give it to you. Okay? That's what Boaz is doing. This is selfless. He's not doing this for his own estate, in the words of the nearer kinsman. He realizes for his own estate, it may be disastrous. But Boaz, Boaz is selfless. Verse 15. He also said, chapter 3, verse 15. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured it into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. And then you find out about this in verse 17 as well. Um, then, she told, uh, then she told, or she added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Empty -handed. So we get it. Boaz Boaz is selfless. What about, what about Jesus? 
Um, Nate read to us a couple of things about the selflessness of Jesus, our King. So not only does David, King of Israel, come from this line of selfless people, and David was, was selfless. He led the troops into battle. He went out against Goliath when nobody would. He gave his life for Israel selflessly. But Jesus, even more so, uh, look at, at Matthew 10, 42 through uh, 45. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life, to be selfless, to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so Boaz takes a portion of his money so that Naomi can have an inheritance. Jesus gives his whole life so that we can have an eternal inheritance. This is Jesus, our King, being selfless. Or Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Nate read this for us as well. Jesus is the example. What was going on in Philippi? There were a couple of women, Euodia and Syntyche, and they were being very selfish. And they were arguing with each other. And so Paul starts out Philippians 2 and says, Hey, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort by him, if any compassion, if you've got anything good in you, be like Jesus. He didn't regard, he, he had a quality with God, the Father. He was in heaven. He had everything he needed. He was untouched by the harm of sin. But for your sake, he came down to the earth, taking the form not just of a man, but of a bondservant, of a slave. And we found him in the appearance of a man. He was a man with flesh and blood. He got hungry. He had to go to the bathroom. He had people insult him. This is Jesus being selfless. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. He had the right to do that. But he didn't. Because our King Jesus was and is selfless. He comes to earth for our sake. Even dying on a cross, as Paul says there, right? Selfless. Giving up himself for us. That we might live. That we might have an inheritance. So, Jesus, like Boaz, was, was selfless. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He made himself poor that you might be rich. Selfless. Not seeking his own gain. Not seeking to become rich, but making himself poor so that others can be rich. Number two, number two, follow Jesus in being selfless. Follow Jesus in being selfless. Um, what does this selflessness entail? You know, when I think of selflessness, I think of my mom. You hear me talk about my dad a lot and his influence on me. Uh, but my mom's influence is just as great. Um, my mom's still living. Some of you have met her. She's been here visiting uh, from, from time to time. And, and my mom, if you, could, if you could characterize my mom and what she goes by, um, her, her whole life uh, toward, toward me, and, and I'm assuming toward my you know, family and all, is what can I do to help? What does John need? so he can get out the door and be successful. What does John need? Does he need a ride? Does he need a lunch? Does he need somebody to come and wake him up three times in the morning so he gets to school on time? Um, does he need someone to write his, to type up his paper? You know, I've told you, you know, she did this in the middle of the night. I'd finish a paper at 2 a.m. It was due the next day. Wake her up, no complaint. She just got up, she typed my paper, brought it to school during the school day. Okay? That's my mom. 
What, and, and, and how can I get out of your way? Okay? What can I do for you? And how can I not be a bother? Okay? Now, my mom doesn't have self-esteem problems. Um, it's just that's who she is. Selfless. Uh, and my, my kids know it today. You know, they love being around my mom. Um, she, she, she goes to the grocery store, gets all this, this food for us before we arrive and, and visit. We spend almost all our vacation time just up at my mom's house. That's what we do for vacation. That's wonderful. You know, she makes sure we got these great meals. It's just, it's just great. I eat so much when I'm up at my mom's. And she just makes sure everything is, is, is good for us. She's just kind and and, and loving and the result for her is she has a son who loves her deeply and she has grand a, a daughter-in-law who loves her wonderfully and loves being around her she has grandkids who can't wait to be with her and my mom's response when we ask her to come visit is oh i don't want to be in the way i don't want to stay for too long you know i, I always tell her mom you, you can't stay too long we just love love you being here and our kids think that too um, that's the result. But our, 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 the message here is to follow Jesus in being selfless. Now, there are two, two things here, A and B, about being selfless uh, in your outline there. And we're just going to cover A uh, today. I made the decision this morning before Sunday school started. I'm just going to cover A because I really want to hit this stuff. It's just very important for you. We're going to cover B next week. And if you want to guess the blanks in the outline in B after the service today, uh, please do, and then, then come, and you'll even benefit more uh, next week. But, but two things. Uh, essentially, uh, we're, we're going to look um, at, <laughs> well, the first thing is, A, what being selfless does for you. Ha ha, get it? <laughs> what being selfless does for you. Now, Jesus is always doing this. He's always telling us to be selfless, and then he's telling us how it's going to bless us. Okay? He's always giving us, do the right thing, for your reward will be great, Jesus says. Be selfless so that you get a great reward. Okay? And so we need to get that in our minds, how that sorts itself out. But do you see that the, the emphasis of that? That's not seek the reward and use people to get it. It's be selfless and the reward will come. Don't worry about the reward, okay? So being selfless, what it does for you. Next week, our B is how do we be selfless? How does that work? How is it that we can be selfless? What does that mean? What are the limits of being selfless? Does that mean I give all the money out of my bank account and I give my house over to people and I'm completely, utterly destitute? Uh, so how do we be selfless? That'll be next week. But for now, we look at what being selfless does for you. And what we're doing here with number one and number two under A is essentially we're contrasting Boaz, who's number one here, with the nearer kinsman, who's going to be described in number two. Okay. So first, Boaz. What being selfless does for you? Number one, selflessness leads to honor, Blessing, a good name, refreshment, joy, and even fame. Selflessness leads to honor, blessing, a good name, refreshment, and even fame. See the crazy contrast with this? Being selfless leads to fame. Being selfless leads to honor. Being selfless leads to being refreshed. Now, the wisdom of the world is being selfless leads you, leaves you exhausted, right? Being selfless leads you to being impoverished. Being selfless leads you to being unnoticed by the world. But not so, because God is in charge and everything's topsy-turvy. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Who's greatest in the kingdom? He who is the greatest servant among you is the greatest in my kingdom, Jesus says. 
So look at verses 11 and 12 here in chapter 4 um, to, to prove this point. So Boaz, we've made the point, he's been selfless and selfless and selfless ever since we've seen him, chapter 2 and chapter 3 and now in chapter 4. He's been selfless. So then in uh, verses 11 and 12 of uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4 here, verse 11, then the elders and all those at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Look at verse 14 now. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. Verse 17. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. That's honor. Okay, Boaz's selflessness means he's this famous predecessor of the greatest king Israel ever had. Even when the Son of God comes, there's reference to David. And Boaz, through his selflessness, receives this honor, receives this fame. He's the forebear of David, who's the forebear of the Son of God. That's pretty hard to top, right? Turn to Philippians 2. Um, we're going to look at the, what Jesus' selflessness led to. Nate read that for us this morning, but I want you to put your eyes on it here. So Paul's talking about being selfless and being humble. That's the solution to the, to the strife that's going on in the church in Philippi. And he sets up Jesus as the example, and we've referenced already verses 5, uh, five through 8. Uh, Jesus did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Okay, um, what's, this, what's this lead for Jesus? Obscurity, uh, lack of fame, uh, a footnote in history. Uh, well, we know that's not true. Jesus' selflessness, his doing things for everyone around him, healing people, stilling and keeping people from drowning, casting demons out from people, being so exhausted that he has to go away to himself and pray to his father for a time because he's so selfless. Being selfless to the point of, as it says there in verse 8 at the end, being obedient to death, even death on a cross, being that selfless, we know that Jesus is the center point of human history. Jesus is the name today that everything is in reference to. And in most countries, even the year we're in is in reference to Jesus, the honor and the fame that Jesus has, right? Right? And if you're talking about Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever, you're, you're, you're referencing Jesus in some way. How does it compare? Christianity is solely centered upon who Jesus is and who he claimed to be, the Son of God. So how's that wind up for Jesus? Even beyond human history, beyond A.D. and B.C. being about him. How's it wind up for him? Verse 9, therefore, because he humbled himself, because he made himself nothing, because he was utterly selfless, how's God treat somebody who's utterly selfless? Somebody in the human flesh who's utterly selfless, like Jesus, like us. How's God treat this Jesus? Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, final judgment, at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everything. Nobody escapes from bowing their knee to Jesus, whether they bow to him as their king or bow to them, bow to him in submission at final judgment, having to admit you are God and you should have been my king. And now I will suffer for it. Every knee of every human being of all history will bow to Jesus. Why? Because he made himself nothing. Selflessness. The most selfless person ever to walk the face of the earth gets the highest position ever to be given. And every tongue, verse 11, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This means God and it means king. We call your king, your Lord. To the glory of God, the Father. So that worked out pretty well for Jesus, didn't it? To answer the Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you, Jesus? And Jesus on his heavenly throne right now says, pretty well. Yeah, all heaven adores me. When I came up here, Revelation 5, everybody shouted with rejoicing. A lamb as uh, looking with his, his marks of being slain with his, in his hands, holes in his hands and in his feet. And all of heaven rejoices and says, at last someone worthy to take the scroll and open its seven seals. Nobody else is worthy but this, but this one. Look back in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse, it's page 788. Paul got this. Paul got this. Paul's talking to the elders of Ephesus. He's traveling through. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He, he, he's bringing to the elders in Jerusalem an, an offering. They were impoverished, but he also wants to go and proclaim the gospel there and encourage the believers there, encourage the saints there. And, and here's what he says to them in verse 35. Um, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul got it. It's more blessed to be selfless than it is to gather things that you would call blessing for yourself. That's what Jesus did. He didn't worry about the blessing. He didn't worry about the reward. He gave himself for us, his people. Um, look at verse 22 there. And now, compelled by the Spirit, Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. I don't care what happens to me. See, Paul's selfless. He gets it. Live your life for other people, not for yourself. Live your life for the Lord, not for yourself. And what, look at this next verse. Why is he willing to be imprisoned, to have these hardships? Verse 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Whatever happens to me, I don't care but I care for other people and I want the gospel of God's grace to get to, get to them. Think about this. If you lead your life in a selfless way, what will that do for your reputation at work? What will that do for your reputation at school? If you're on an athletic team, will, you, will, will your coach like you if you're selfless, if you play for the team, if you do what's necessary for the team to win instead of pursuing your own stats or playing time or whatever? Here, here's where this comes to the fore. You know who has a lot of people at their funerals? It's the people who are selfless. There are long lines in funeral homes. 
not for the people who sought reward. There are long lines in funeral homes. There are big crowds at funerals for people who are selfless, who spent their lives doing good things for people at their own expense. And they all come to the funeral home and they all talk about this thing that this now dead person has done for them. That's what separates whether people say, oh, yeah, I should go to that funeral. To funerals where people say, I, I got to go. I, I, I got to travel. I, I have to be. I have to be there to pay my respects. I owe so much to this person. As Christians, we know this. And we don't live our lives so that there are a lot of people at our funeral. We won't know who shows up. Our family will, oh, but we won't. But do you see how this point is driven into us as we're now living? Live selflessly, and that will go well for you. It'll go well for you at work. It'll go well for you at school. It'll go well for you on your team. It'll go well for you and your family. Okay, you're going to have a good relationship with your sibling if you're selfless with your sibling. Yeah, you sure are. Your mom, your mom and get, dad really going to love you if you're selfless and you help them out. Yeah, that's right. So um, my dad talked about being a giver and being a taker. Um, and uh, I was a taker growing up. I was the youngest kid and everybody was doing everything for me. And I became a real taker. Uh, but the good news of this, I got to see my family be real givers to me. Uh, and they became a good example of what I should be instead of, instead of what I was. Uh, but uh, selflessness leads to honor, blessing, a good name, refreshment, joy, and even fame. And then the second thing, so that's Boaz. All these things are for him. Second thing, selfish, selfishness selfishness in its pursuit to gain all the above, in its pursuit to gain honor and blessing and a good name and refreshment and joy and fame, selfishness, seeking all these things for oneself, here's your blank, forfeits it. Forfeits it. It's a great uh, paradox with how things work in the world and for you. Um, Tiger Woods, anybody? I love Tiger Woods and I try to pray for him that he'd become a believer uh, To Essentially, I quit playing golf after that scandal with him. I think it was in part because of that, partly because I stunk at golf and got tired of stinking. I don't like stinking. It's not fun to stink. Um. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what if he were selfless toward his wife? Is there anyone in the whole sports world that doubts that the reason he hasn't won a single major since he was shown to be unfaithful to his wife, that anyone thinks that is anything but what is going on in his soul? It's not about his what is his glute not following through or, or whatever it is. It's not, it's not about these various physical ailments. He's lost that, that, that drive, that ability. I remember, I think it was Ernie Els talking about, there's something about when you know Ernie Els is another great golfer. Um, and he was talking about this early on as Tiger was coming back into the golf scene after he had taken some time off. He, he said, there's something where... When you're trying to make a putt, if you feel like you're not worthy as a person, you, you just kind of can't make it. Um, verses 6, uh, 8, and 17. Um, <laughs> look at verse 6. Look at verse 6 here. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it. I cannot do it. He says, I cannot. He can. He's just not willing. Why? Because he may lose part of his estate. What he's building up for himself may be, may be gone. 
Okay? But do you see here? We don't even know his name. It's not recorded. No fame for the selfish. And his estate, he hasn't had that for 2,100 years. He's been without his estate. It's gone. He died and it vanished. He didn't build up for himself. He didn't gain fame. He wasn't refreshed. Israel didn't call him blessed. He wasn't the thought. See what he forfeited? He could have been the name who was this ancestor of David, the greatest king Israel ever known. He could have been the forebear of Jesus, and he forfeits it because he's selfish. And this is the contrast we're supposed to see as believers. Jesus says, be the greatest servant in this world. The kings lord it over you, and they extract from you. But not so with you, Jesus says. He who is great in my kingdom shall become your servant, shall become the least of all of you. Now sit down so I can wash your feet. So Mark 8, 34 and 35. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Deny your own selfishness. Deny doing what you want to do. Deny yourself and take up your cross. You know what that means? Live as dead to yourself. If you've taken up a cross, your life is over. And this is what Jesus is saying to us. Live for other people. Consider your life over, your ambitions over. Okay, we'll qualify that next, next week. But live dead to your own selfish desires. Live, live dead to your fame. Live dead to your honor. That's what Jesus did in taking up his cross. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, here's the forfeit part. Whoever wants to save his life, will lose it. And whoever loses his life, whoever gives his life for other people, whoever lives selflessly, will, gain, will save it. And then the famous line of Jesus, verse 36 of Mark 8, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Okay, last thing for us. Selfishness in its pursuit to gain all the above forfeits it. And that's what we see in this near kinsman. In order to gain for himself, he forfeits a, a, a wonderful wife who already had renown in Bethlehem, the Moabites, Ruth. Forfeits a, a wonderful wife, forfeits being the, the forebear of David, being famous for being a forebear of Jesus. But then this last comment here, self Fishness also can easily lead to, here are a couple of things, to depression. Why, why would not, this is not always the, the, the case, and there are lots of things going on with depression, and if, you're, if you suffer from that, please talk to me. I've got some experience with that and you know, it can help you there. But if you're always considering how other people are treating you, if you're always considering how things affect you, uh, how something inconveniences you, um, how this affects you, here you and all that. How does this affect me? What will this mean for me? Uh, what will this mean for my estate? What will this mean for my time? You're going to be depressed because people don't treat you well. People don't put you first. To do anything is to lose something. And so that will tend you or lead you toward depression. Um, it'll make you jealous and it'll make you envy. If you're always thinking of yourself, if you're being selfish, you will be a jealous person, you'll be an envious person. And, and instead of seeing somebody with a great car and saying, oh, that's awesome, and rejoicing with that person, you'll be angry at that person. You'll be envious of that person. You see something, and in selfishness, everything is in, in terms of what someone else has and what you don't have. 
and that'll make you an ugly person inside. And as a result of this, you will have strained or broken relationships. If you're always thinking about how this affects you, your relationships are going to be strained and broken because relationships are always about uh, forgiving and being patient with and giving of your time and, and your money and your person and your energy and your emotion to other people. If you are always considering, what can I get? If you're selfish, if you're that person who takes the last piece of cake or the last cookie or the last piece of pie, okay, test next week with Providence, right? <laughs> People aren't going to, they're not going to want to be around you. It's like if you're watching Fresh Off the Boat on ABC Tuesdays at 8 or 8.30, there we go, that's the advertisement. They, these networks never send me kickbacks. Um, it's Jessica, the mom. She's always considering everything in, in relation to how does this benefit me? Or if this person gets that, how is it going to affect me? And she's always taking and considering and, and, and doing things to the detriment of other people so that she has, so that she, so that she gets. And no one wants to be around her. Her, her. her family loves her. Her husband loves her. But it's like, oh, no. Here she comes. Um, and, and, and the people in the neighborhood don't want to be around her because she's always just considering herself. So, conclusion. Number three. Want a life of being blessed? Want a life of being blessed? Be selfless. Be selfless. Boaz was, and he reflects who Jesus was for us. Our selfless king, who sets as a standard for the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God of which we are members, selflessness as our, as our ethic.